Hey, Joe, this week I'm going to talk to you about Skyping in the classroom. I love to connect my students with scientists from around the world. It gives me and my students an opportunity to meet some really amazing people who are passionate about science. So today I want to tell you a little bit about why I Skype, how I set up my Skypes, and some fun stories about some of my Skyping experiences. First, let me tell you why I think Skyping is so important. One thing that Skyping helps do is it helps me model skills that I want my students to have. In today's day and age, you can't be an expert at everything, but you can connect with experts really easily. And so that's a skill I want my students to have, so I model it through Skyping. Another reason I Skype is because one of my fears as a teacher is that I will squash someone's passion for science because they don't like me or they don't like how I teach. Let me tell you a quick story. When I was in high school, I thought I didn't like history. I thought it was boring. I didn't really see how it applied to me. Uh, and I didn't realize that I had been deceived until I got to college and had a professor who was passionate about it. When I was in high school, my history teacher was also a sports coach, and he invested most of his time into being a good coach. But the downside was he wasn't a great teacher. His strategy was to walk in the front of the room, assign the section for us to read, assign the questions for us to answer, and then go back to his computer and work on his coaching. And so I had been tricked into thinking that I hated history, and it wasn't until later I realized that I loved it. And I don't want that to happen to my students. So by connecting them with other people in the science field, even if they don't like me, they can still see themselves in science and still be passionate about it. Another thing, in our high school, every science teacher is male. And so I feel bad for a lot of the female science students who are fantastic students, but maybe they can't picture themselves as a scientist because every scientist they're used to seeing has always been male. And so by bringing in really, really cool female scientists, it can kind of start to break that stereotype and let my students envision themselves in the future as being a scientist. The last reason I like to Skype is because my students love it. They always look forward to our next Skype call. They always are asking questions, Mr. Tim, when's our next one going to be? And when I announce it, they usually get excited for it. And during the Skype, they're super engaged, uh, super focused, ask great questions. And on top of that, that makes it fun for me because I, I can tell my students really enjoy it. Uh, and also, honestly, I love hanging out with these people too. I'm passionate about science. The people I Skype with are passionate about science. So it's very easy for us to kind of have a connection like that. And I get to live a little bit vicariously through them, right? I get to see people talking about going out in the field and doing research. All the things that I kind of like to do uh, and imagine myself being able to do, I get to actually see it happening not with me, but with someone I'm Skyping with. So the next thing I want to explain is how I go about the process of setting up a Skype call with a scientist. So the first thing I try to do is I try to have some sort of idea of what kind of animal I'm interested in Skyping with my students. And then I can make a graphic using Canva, which is an app on the iPad where you can make kind of neat little graphics for posting on Twitter. And then I will post it on Twitter and use the hashtag uh, SciCom which is for scientists who want to communicate their work, which is exactly what I'm looking for. And I do that several times. Uh, about half the time I would get a response and half the time no one would respond, which is fine. So then the next step I would do is I would look for maybe people I follow on Twitter who I think would do a good job Skyping with my students. Maybe they post a lot of cool pictures. Maybe they talk about their research. And then I can either email them or send them a DM on Twitter. And then when they respond, we can kind of start to set up a schedule. Usually then I'll move on to email. We'll email back and forth four or five times. It's always amazing to me how there are like scientists who are busy doing their work who are willing to sacrifice an hour or two of their time just to hang out with some random students in the middle of Nebraska. So that always blows my mind that these people are so willing to help me out with that. Uh, the next step is usually I try to do a practice Skype. Um, that way they can make sure like their technology is good and their microphone works and their internet connections fast enough and things like that. And that's really where we get really into the topics we want to cover. Uh, usually I have some sort of idea of an angle I want to use to approach the topic. Uh, but then usually they can bounce ideas off me. I can make suggestions and then we kind of get it finalized. And I can email them like an outline 
of what they can talk about or they can send me pictures if they've taken pictures of their research and things like that. Last, I just want to share a few fun stories of some of the people I've Skyped with. The first one was with Dr. Kat Bolstad, who is a squid scientist in New Zealand, uh, which is 17 hours time difference from Aurora. So that was a little bit tough scheduling, um, but she was amazing. She is kind of like a big wig scientist who has graduate people um, studying under her that she's in charge of, and she just did a fantastic job. Although my students about died when she started talking about uh, spermatophores. They weren't quite ready for that. Then the next one was Zoe Hughes, who is a museum curator. She works with brachiopods, which are small shellfish. Um, and so we talked about the importance of conserving animals that are unattractive. Then we talked to Adam Cart, who is at Harvard studying zebrafish. And so that was another different perspective because he was looking at it as how is this animal useful for our research, doing cancer research and aging research. Uh, developmental research, uh, which was really cool for my students to see. Then we talked to Derek Hennon, who is a millipede expert. He really talked about adaptations that millipedes have. For example, one species of millipede will wrap its eggs in a layer of poop. That way, when the eggs hatch, they can get the right bacteria from the mom's poop so they can digest dead leaves right away. Then the next one was Lyndall Beatty, who is a shark scientist from Maine. And she studies rays and sharks, so different elasmobranchs. And she focused on development. Uh, so some sharks lay eggs, some sharks give birth to live young, and some sharks do like a hybrid of the two where they have eggs, but they hatch inside the mother and they have like an umbilical cord hooked up to a yolk sac. So it's kind of freaky to think about. Um, and she was awesome. She had a cool story. She actually was one of maybe like 200 people in the history of the world to be on this island of the Galapagos doing research, which I thought was cool. And then the last one was Amber Hart, who is not someone who's gone to college to study science. She's just a regular citizen who had a passion for birding. And so she started looking at loons and keeping track of their populations. And my students loved talking to her because they really connected with her. And a lot of them are like, well, I don't have what it takes to be a scientist or I don't want to be a scientist. But she showed that you can just pursue your passion and do what you love uh, and make some cool contributions to science that way. So the highlight for this week is really easy for me to come up with. Uh, I was super excited for that activity uh, and we did a human genetic disorder presentation. And since this was our fifth presentation we've done, I thought my students were ready to have me record them and then publish those videos on YouTube. That way I can show off uh, their awesome work with their parents and they can share it with their grandparents. Anyone who wants to see them uh, do their presentation, can check it out. And I thought it went really, really well. A lot of students were really nervous because having a camera in front of their face is kind of intimidating, but I thought they did a really good job and those are posted and I'll share a link in the description of this video so you can check them out if you are interested in that as well. The struggle this week I want to talk about is just attendance. It always seems like in the spring activities are going like crazy and students are missing a lot of class and that's always super stressful for the students and it's stressful for me too because then I worry about them learning the material when they're not in class. For example, Friday was district music contest, and I actually had 65% of my students missing class. And so it was hard for me to know, do I just waste the day, an hour and a half of class time just wasted because so many people are gone, or do I try to do some content, but then I don't want the people who are gone to be missing so much they can't get caught up. So what I did is I shared a YouTube playlist showing some of the videos I showed in class. So hopefully my students will have watched that, and next week we'll see if they actually did. The activity this week I want to share is just a quick little uh, competition activity that we did in class. We're in ecology units, so we were talking about uh, two different organisms competing for uh, the same resource. Uh, so what I had them do is they made a food web, and then they had to pick two organisms in the food web and talk about what they were competing for. And then that brings in the competitive exclusion principle, which says if two organisms have the exact same niche, one will survive and the other will die. So anytime you do have two organisms in an ecosystem, they must have a different niche. So they just went through and explained how their niches were different. And then Friday, uh, we actually applied that to our loon Skype. So I said, okay, we practiced this yesterday. Now today, I want you to think about a loon, come up with something it's competing with, what it's competing for, and how their niches are different so they can both survive. So I thought it was kind of cool to tie in what we were doing in class directly with a, a Skyping activity we had just done. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Educating Joe. Feel free to like, comment, or subscribe. And to all the other Educating Joes out there, have a great week teaching.